Good evening. Welcome to LTUE's 2021 presentation of Horses in War. The horse. The horse is Poseidon's gift to mankind. Combining the masculine virtues of strength and courage with the feminine virtues of beauty and grace, horses flow with the mane and tail streaming in the wind, looking like water with the ease and agility of their movements. This is what we're going to talk about because horses are not simply an object of beauty to be admired, but they're a weapon of war to be used. Since Paleolithic times, horses have fascinated humans, often as not as a prey animal, but at the same point, the men who, with their dogs and the dog cousins, the wolves, followed the great herds of horses across the steppe of Central Asia, managed to capture them rather than kill them, and learned eventually to harness their strength for more than just protein and leather. Horses then were barely ponies by today's standards, and along with the Asiatic wild ass, or onager, they were used to pull, pull a travois-type construction to haul their meager possessions across um, the step by the herdsmen. But with the invention of the wheel, the combination of equine and cart became far more than just a tool. It became a weapon of war. By the way, the reason the wheel wasn't used in the Americas was due uh, more to a lack of uh, draft animals, and it wasn't due to their stupidity. They actually had pull toys with wheels. So it's interesting when people say, oh, they didn't invent the wheel. Actually, they did. Uh, it's just they didn't have any animals available to pull anything until the Spaniards showed up. Even with the onagers or ponies, and by the way, the Romans called their catapults onagers because of the way they bucked. Uh, but the new chariot became the most powerful weapon of its age. The wild horse barbarians of the steppe could now sweep down in, onto farming communities at a speed far greater than a man could run, and they proceeded to conquer them with fair ease. It's noteworthy that farming villages began building walls at the same time as chariots became a weapon of war. This set the stage for the political process throughout the Eurasian landmass that was to last for the next several thousand years. Wild horse barbarians would sweep in and defeat the decadent rulers of the city, state, village, or whatever. They would set themselves up as the new ruling class. They'd become, after a few generations, decadent rulers and be replaced by their wild cousins from the plains. Rinse and repeat as necessary. The chariot pulled by horses or onagers as the primary weapon system of the Bronze Age spread from China to Britain. Usually there were three riders in the chariot. You'd have a driver, an archer, and a spearman. Although, at times, there were, with lighter chariots, there would be no spearman. But there's always a driver and an archer. Boudicca fought Rome with chariots. King Tut may well have been killed by being run over by a chariot. Interesting point. In the Iliad, the Greek heroes ride into battle on their chariots, but they dismount to fight. This is a really early usage of the chariot. Uh, it was echoed by the Plains Indians before they really learned the gifts of the horse. And they did the same thing. They would ride into battle, dismount, and fight. Interesting parallels there. At some point, horses were bred large enough to ride. And I guarantee you that the way it came about was some 12-year-old boy was taking his father's horse, horses down to, uh, to water them. And some other kid said, double dog dare you, you can't get on that. And uh, so he did. He jumped on the back of the horse. The horse took off like, a, like it was hit by lightning. And uh, at some point, the little boy fell off, jumped up, laughed. And his father, after making sure that the kid wasn't dead or had any broken bones, beat the snot out of him, and then thought, hmm, there might be something to this. So the horseman was born. A far more versatile and agile weapon than the chariot, cavalry, 
was set to become the weapon system of the ancient world. Oh, by the way, also pants come with horses. It's hard to ride a horse without wearing pants. Every new weapon has a counterpart meant to defeat it. Since infantry, spread out and armed with fairly short weapons, was very vulnerable to cavalry charges, they learned to bunch up and use long spears. The Greeks learned this very well, adding to it the discipline necessary to make such a formation work, such as marching in step. They made the phalanx their own primary weapon system. With a bronze-plated shield, helmet, and 18 to 22 foot spear, they could keep cavalry at bay and steamroll their infantry opponents. But they did keep their cavalry too. For example, Alexander and his marvelous warhorse and friend Bucephalus um, have come down in history as leaders of cavalry. Foot archers could also be a problem for horsemen. This was solved by becoming archers themselves. Of note is the fact that virtually everywhere outside of Western Europe, it was the horse archer who became the primary weapon system for cavalry, not the lancer. Now, oftentimes they'd carry a lance and a bow, but in Western Europe, it was a lancer, not an archer, who was the knight. Rome learned to its sorrow the lessons of the Parthian shot, sometimes called the parting shot, where heavily armed horsemen, the cataphracts, would charge in well, and suddenly turn about and fire their arrows at the enemy while riding away out of range of the infantry's weapons. Of note here, horses have always had a distinct influence on social structure. As noted earlier, horsemen from the wilds would supplant their decadent cousins, uh, and eventually the upper classes were associated with horses. And for instance, the equine class in Rome. It took money to outfit cavalry, but with it came power. This was why in the colonial Spanish possessions, Indians were forbidden to ride horses. They could only ride mules and burros. Furthermore, the language of social structure was affected by the horse. As in almost all languages, except as far as I can tell, English and Japanese, the word for knight is the same as that for horseman. Writer, caballero, chevalier. Interestingly and oddly, English and Japanese, their term for knight and, and samurai come from a root for servant. Hmm. Strange stuff. With the fall of Rome in the West, cavalry became somewhat moribund, but it was to become ever more important in the Eastern Empire. Cavalry fights cavalry, though one does need infantry to defeat elephants. Horses are usually absolutely terrified of elephants and refuse to charge them, preferring to be elsewhere when they appear on the battlefield, so you need infantry to deal with this. This is something which the Saracens newly infused with uh, martial vigor by Islam, had to learn. Using the virtues of light cavalry, such as speed and endurance, they could run circles around their heavily armed counterparts, but only after conquering Syria and enlisting former Byzantine soldiers to their cause and their jihad could they fight the Persians. And while man-to-man -man, the Persian cataphracts were superior to the Arab light horsemen, they were worn down and beaten by numbers. In the West, it was infantry which was the dominant force in battle, from Clovis to Charles Martel. However, though defeating the Muslim invaders at Tours in 732 with the disciplined Frankish infantry, it was seen that there was indeed a need for cavalry. Border skirmishes throughout most of, uh, of the borderlands, such as conquered Spain, and the Balkans and Hungary showed a need, and it was filled. At this time, somewhere around the 800s, uh, early 800s, late 700s, is when the stirrup was introduced. You may think this is like, oh, what's so big about a stirrup? Well, the stirrup actually aids the guy who isn't that great a horseman, uh, and it helps you stand in the stirrup so you can slash down with greater ease, and generally makes the whole the whole operation of uh, riding a horse a lot easier. With Saracen lightning thrusts and Viking raids and coastal and river settlements, 
cavalry detachments were situated to respond to these attacks. Cavalry, especially armored cavalry, is expensive, however, and in time a very limited in a time of very limited economy, poor farming methods, etc., it was necessary that some 90% of the populace must toil to supply a trained horseman horses, armor, and a retainer to protect them. Feudalism was born. The idea of having 90% have to support the 10% or 99% to support the 1% is nothing new. You really can't separate feudalism from horses. The entire motivation for the economic system was to supply sufficient heavy cavalry to defeat an enemy and to defend the area from depredations of others. And by the 11th century, heavy cavalry, armed with a lance and sword, shield, and armored in mail and a steel helmet, was the dominant weapon system in Western Europe. It won the Battle of Hastings for William the Bastard and would not be seriously challenged for another 500 years at least. The Crusades taught the Western Europeans a great deal about, about cavalry and warfare, and it confirmed in them a strong belief in heavy cavalry. But it also gave them a greater appreciation for projectile weapons. For most of Europe, this meant crossbows, and a mounted crossbowman accompanying an armored horseman became common. In England, in its conquest of Wales, they also learned the efficacy of projectile weapons. In this case, it was the Welsh longbow. One English knight found himself pinned to his horse, his now dead horse, with a Welsh arrow going through his male hauberk, his male chausses, both sides, his thigh, the saddle, and into the horse to kill it. That was rather awkward. Adopting this as their own, the English proceeded to use it against the Scots, who themselves had adopted the idea of using mass spearmen to hold the English horsemen at bay. The English learned the power of combined weapons, using the threat of their heavy cavalry to keep the Scots in a tight formation, and then slaughtered them with arrows from their newfound Welsh longbowmen. Around this time, the 1200s, late 1200s, early 1300s, plate armor started making its way into the armor truce of, uh, of heavy cavalrymen. Uh, mail is a wonderful defense, but it has its shortcomings. And against heavy arrows uh, was one of them. France had long put a de the defense of the kingdom in the hands of their heavy cavalry and would continue to do so for several centuries. But it had several major reverses along the way. At the Battle of the Spurs, Flemish spearmen taught them to respect disciplined infantry. While at Crecy, Poitiers, and Agincourt, the English taught them to respect their English and Welsh archers. Through the defeats, though, the French monarchy learned the, some valuable lessons. During the course of the Hundred Years' War, they put together the Compagnies de Ordonnance, or Companies of Ordnance, starting in 1440. These were French noblemen who supplied their own horses and armor, but they were organized in companies of 30 to 100 knights. Each, uh, each of them had up to seven followers, three archers, a custodier, a squire, several others. But they were also paid for by the king. They were disciplined and expected to obey the king or his officers only. They were going completely around the old feudal levy this way. So they became a powerhouse for the king and only obedient to the king. Secondly, the, the Bureau brothers put together a train of artillery, which had been, the artillery had been in use for several centuries by this time, by the mid-1400s, um, but sort of desultory. And the Brothers Bureau put a strong logistics effort behind that, and they're able to knock the English castles out throughout France. English tactics had been to basically find a, the French army that had been raised by the feudal levy to go fight them. And they would put, the English would put themselves into a strong defensive position, sucker the French nobility into a frontal assault, and then slaughter them with arrows. Uh, this worked really, really well because nobody ever, ever, ever 
said at the time that the French lacked courage. They would always do a frontal assault if they could get away with it, even when they couldn't. By 1452, however, the French had figured it out. How to beat the English? They had their disciplined cavalry who would obey orders not to charge, and the French would let the English put themselves into a strong position and did this at Formigny. Then the French brought up their artillery and pounded the English until they lost their minds and charge. And at that point, the French cavalry charged them from the side and voila, victory. They'd finally broken that lock. Also, starting in the 1400s, the Swiss, still fighting for their independence against the House of Habsburg, developed their own version of the phalanx, the pike square. Imagine you and 4,000 of your relatives and neighbors in a fairly compact square formation, literally square formation, all armed with 18-foot spears, a.k.a. pikes. With discipline and close association, and again, very much like the Greek phalanx, a very close-knit social structure, they could keep most horsemen at bay. And with astonishing insolence, would he actually even attack both other infantry and even cavalry at the run? Uh, these Swiss were, were something else. This became the infantry weapon system for the next 200 years or so, and especially when paired with the newly developed arquebus and then the musket, they became a formidable weapon indeed. Yet the French, when they used their heads, had the weapon system for defeating it. They had cavalry to keep them in place, and using new cast bronze, much lighter than iron artillery, they could mow them down. But as with all things, we have thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. All three weapon systems would be used together in a Rochambeau-style, paper-rock-scissors way, and continues to be so to this day. You have cavalry, artillery, and infantry. If you don't use them all together intelligently, you lose. Early 16th century cavalry was, by all measures, incredibly effective. They were fully armored men on fully armored horses, and French knights could and did charge all the way through these pike squares. If you've ever seen the Lipitzaner horses of the Spanish riding school in Vienna, these airs above ground, where the horse leaps into the air, kicks out with all four feet, etc., you've seen what the cavalry could, could and did do in a tight infantry formation. The rider is really only there to protect the horse at that point. The horse is doing all the damage. If you've ever been kicked by a horse, you know what it's like. In the later words of Ranger Captain Jack Hayes, let the bone and muscle of your horse be your weapon. Despite the appearance of infantry firearms in the battlefield, it did not, contrary to popular opinion, drive the armored knight off the field. Armored horsemen could easily stay out of the effective range of such arquebuses and even muskets that were at most 200 yards at best and quickly cover that ground in seconds. If you've ever been on a charging horse, or worse yet, if you've ever been on the receiving end of a horse char charging at you, they can cover ground very, very quickly. Rather, it was the introduction of the pistol, in this case the wheelock pistol, which changed the nature of cavalry. Prior firearms had required an external ignition source, such as a slow match, to fire the weapon. But the wheel lock, while, while very complex and delicate, obviated this and allowed a horseman to carry a number of them, up to six on his horse or person, ready to fire. While of short effective range, modern experiments show that a wheel lock pistol's bullet could pierce armor at 15 feet or so, which is about the length of a lance which, by the way, couldn't pierce armor. It could knock you off your horse, but it couldn't pierce your armor. And while an armored knight could stay away from the rather lumbering infantry, they could not avoid lighter armored pistoliers. Thus, the heavy armored man-at-arms on his armored horse faded from the battlefield. 
Tactics such as the caracol, snail, which gives you an idea of what that entailed, were developed for pistoliers to use against each other. But against infantry, they proved pretty ineffective. For while pistols had power at short range, muskets had a whole lot more range. So cavalry on the continent was more used against other cavalry at, by this time, uh, unless they were breaking already retreating infantry. The Thirty Years' War brought change. Most armor was gradually discarded, save for helmet, breastplate, backplate, buff coat, and sometimes a bridal gauntlet. And as armor disappeared, the primary use of the pistol did too. Cromwell's disciplined Puritans of his iron sides learned to hold their formations together while charging home, and then they'd turn and attack again while the poorly disciplined Royalist cavalry would continue on to sack the enemy baggage train and lose the battle. It was back to the sword becoming the primary weapon, but pistols were held in reserve should armor reappear on the battlefield. One of the oddities of cavalry is that the generals always discover that they need mounted infantry with them to hold any ground that they have captured. They also discovered that these mounted infantry develop a strong aversion to dismount. Thus, the mounted arquebusiers and carbineers of the 16th century morph into carbineer cavalry of the 17th. Dragoons of the 17th century were developed to provide infantry support, and then they refused to dismount and become heavy or light dragoons in the 18th century. In the 19th century, we see mounted rifles, who were later designated cavalry. Uh, just like carbineers, etc. Uh, the carbineers, of course, thought they were the real cavalry, even though it's lancers, I guess, who really would be. But anyway, it's all semantic, and they all argue forever about it. By the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, they just took infantrymen from infantry regiments, put them on horses, and called them mounted infantry, and made them go back to being infantry when they were done. Cavalry continued to be used heavily throughout the 18th and 19th century, by now mostly stripped of their armor and equipped with sword, carbine, and pistols. Heavy cavalry continued to be held in reserve by the generals for their decisive moment in battle, when they'd be thrown against a faltering opponent. But light cavalry, developed from various frontier ranging or bandit groups, became more and more important. Rather than simply groping for an enemy army, organized scouting by light cavalry became the rule. Hussars and light dragoons gained popularity with both the generals and the public. Such light horse not only scouted for the enemy, but screened against the enemy's own light horsemen as well. They were the eyes and ears of an army. They were likewise well-versed in plunder, as one American Civil War infantryman said, I never saw a hungry cavalryman. Infantry technology advanced as well, with the bayonet replacing the pike by 1700 or so, making all the infantrymen both musketeer and pikemen. But it was the wide introduction of rifles and infantry in the 1850s which gave the cavalrymen pause. Rapid-fire repeating rifles introduced in the late 19th century increased the infantryman's range, but likewise, the cavalrymen got these too. Machine guns are often thought to have been the death knell of cavalry in World War I, but actually it was rapid-fire artillery that did that. They could destroy cavalry or infantry formations at long range. Uh, removed the horses, certainly from major combat, in the Western battlefields, although they were always held in reserve. Uh, because basically, while a man can dig a hole, horses stand up and remain a big target. But even then, on the fringes of empire, cavalry remained viable. In World War I, in the Mideast, and during the Bolshevik Revolution, and even into World War II, horse cavalry remained a force to be reckoned with although nothing like it had been. The last formal charge, when I say formal, charge of the U.S. Cavalry happened in the Philippines in April of 1942, when a platoon of Philippine scouts under Lieutenant Ed Ramsey charged a Japanese infantry battalion with pistols. 
But that was really not the end of it. Captain Christopher Miller, late acting Secretary of Defense, led mounted troops into battle in Afghanistan in the early phase of the war on terror, proving that the horse as a weapon of war has not run its course. So I'd like to thank you for being here, and I'd like to thank LTUE 2021 for hosting this, and I invite the discussion afterwards. Thank you.